Hello friends, today's topic is about humerus. It is a bone of arm and it is the longest and strongest bone of upper limb. The humerus is a long bone and consists of three parts, the upper end, the shaft and the lower end. The upper end presents the following five features, head, neck, greater tubercle, lesser tubercle and intertubercular sulcus. The lower end presents the following seven features. Capitulum is a lateral round convex projection. Trochlea it is a medial pulley shaped structure. Radial fossa it is a small fossa present above the capitulum. Coronoid fossa it is a small fossa present above the trochlea. The medial epicondyle it is a very prominent projection on the medial side. This is a medial epicondyle. Lectoral epicondyle. This. This is also a prominent projection on the lateral side but is less prominent than the medial epicondyle. Olecranon fossa. It is a large, deep, hollow on the posterior aspect just above the trochlea. We can see here. Now, the shaft. The shaft is a long part of bone extending between its upper end and lower ends. It is cylindrical in the upper half and triangular in the lower half when we do cross section of this bone. Now, how to hold this bone in the anatomical position? The rounded head, this is the rounded head which makes nearly less than half of a sphere the rounded head will be placed medially backward and little upward like this the lesser tubercle this is the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle the greater tubercle will be placed laterally and lesser tubercle will be placed medially and the vertical groove between these two is called intertubercular sulcus. The olecranon fossa. This is the olecranon fossa. This will be present on the lower flattened in faces posteriorly. So we have determined the upper and the lower ends and the shaft. Now the sides. Greater tubercle present on the lateral aspect and lesser tubercle present on the medial aspect we can determine its lateral and medial side now we will discuss the various special features and attachments first the upper end the part of which we will discuss the head the head is a smooth rounded and forms nearly one third or we can say less than a half of a sphere humerus has three necks anatomical neck surgical neck and morphological now we will discuss the special features and attachments for the upper end we will discuss here the head it is smooth rounded and forms nearly one third of a sphere now it is covered by an articular hyaline cartilage the humerus consists of three necks anatomical neck surgical neck and morphological neck anatomical neck is a constriction at the margins of the rounded head it provides attachment to the capsular ligament of the shoulder joint surgical neck it's a short constriction in the upper end of shaft just below the greater and lesser tubercles the important feature here that it is related to axillary nerve and posterior and anterior circumflex humeral vessels morphological neck it is basically a junction between diaphysis and epiphysis now in the greater tubercle it is the most lateral part of proximal end of humerus now greater tubercle presents the insertion for three muscles the upper portion of the tubercle for insertion of supraspinatus middle portion for infraspinatus and lowest 
portion, uh, lowest portion of this rotor tubercle for the insertion of teres minor muscle. We can remember the mnemonic sit for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor muscles. This is the lesser tubercle. It's a small elevation. It provides insertion for subscapularis muscle. Between these two tubercles, there is a sulcus, vertical groove, which is called intertubercular sulcus, or we can say bicipital groove. There are insertion of three muscles in this bicipital groove. The pectoralis measure is inserted on the lateral lip of this groove. Teres measure on the medial lip of this groove and latissimus dorsi in the floor of this groove. We can remember the mnemonic lady between two measure that is latissimus dorsi between pectoralis measure and teres measure. Now we will discuss shaft. Here we will discuss the borders and surfaces of shaft. First is the anterior border. It starts from the lateral lip of intertubercular sulcus descends down to the anterior margin of deltoid tuberosity. We will discuss it later and down and down to become smooth and rounded in lower half where it ends in the radial fossa. So we can trace it down like this up to radial fossa. This is the anterior border. This is the anterior border. Medial border. It extends from the medial lip of bicipital groove, descends down to the medial epicondyle. Tracing like this. Up to the medial epicondyle. This is the medial border and the lateral border it is nearly indistinct in the upper part while its lower part is prominent where it forms the lateral supracondylar ridge this is the lateral supracondylar ridge just above the lateral epicondyle about its middle this border is crossed by radial groove from behind now in the medial border the lower part of medial border gives attachment to the medial intermuscular septum and the lower part of lateral border gives attachment to lateral intermuscular septum. Now the surfaces. First is the anteromedial surface which is the surface between the anterior margin and medial border that is anterior border and the medial border. Second is anterolateral surface. It is bounded by the anterior border and the lateral border and the posterior surface. This lies between the medial and the lateral borders. In the lower part of the shaft, we have the origin for brachialis muscle. So the whole area covering this is the origin for brachialis muscle. In the medial border, there is insertion of coracobrachialis. In the lateral border, we have origin for brachioradialis here. Medial supracondylar ridge, we have origin for pronator teres. In the posterior aspect, just above for the origin of Anconius, we have the origin for supinator muscle. The deltoid tuberosity, which is a V shaped tuberosity, which is present in the middle, which is present in the middle aspect of the anterolateral surface. This is the anterolateral surface, and this is the deltoid tuberosity which gives the insertion of deltoid muscle in the posterior surface this is the posterior surface between the medial and lateral borders 
there is an oblique ridge directed downward and laterally oblique ridge directed downward and laterally and provides origin to lateral head of triceps brachii and below and medial to this ridge is the radial or spiral groove medial and below radial or spiral groove which lodges radial nerve and profunda brachii vessels now the entire posterior surface below this spiral groove gives origin to medial head of triceps brachii now discussing about the lower end it is flattened presenting the following parts the capitulum rounded convex lateral part of the lower end of humerus it articulates with the head of radius trochlea it articulates with trochlear notch of ulna this is the medial epicondyle and just posterior to it there is passage for ulna nerve like here. the anterior surface of medial epicondyle provides an area for common flexor origin of superficial flexors of forearm this is the lateral epicondyle and lateral part of this lateral epicondyle provides an area for common extensor origin the posterior surface of lateral epicondyle gives origin to the anconius muscle here we have the origin for anconius muscle here in the medial epicondyle we have origin for common flexors of forearm and in lateral epicondyle just lateral part of it we have origin for common extensors of forearm this is the coronoid fossa and it fits with the coronoid process of ulna during full flexion of elbow this is radial fossa and it fits the head of radius during full flexion of elbow in the posterior aspect we have the olecranon fossa which fits the olecranon process of ulna during full extension of elbow the capsule of elbow joint is attached above the coronoid and radial fossa anteriorly and posteriorly above the olecranon fossa the common sites of fractures of humerus this is the supracondylar region shaft and surgical neck